Deborah, thank you kindly for such an awesome introduction and what a pleasure to be with you guys today. I was joking with Jeff that this is the only time Calgary and Edmonton can come together. I'm from Calgary, but honestly, what a pleasure to be with you guys. Women in sport means so much to me. I've had the opportunity to cover it for about 10 years now being a journalist and I'm so honored to be able to moderate a roundtable discussion with three incredible women who have just paved the way for this sport, not just in our province, but in our country. So why don't we just open it up right now? The Angels, past, present, and future. I'll introduce our guests first, and in no order, uh, Janine Helland. She has a long history with the Angels, dating back to 1988. Her resume is incredible, representing Canada at two Women's World Cups, part of 10 years with the national team, also a top athlete at the University of Alberta, won a national championship, and of course, heavily involved in planning many of these large scale soccer events we've had in this country, of course, including the 2015 Women's World Cup, which left such an indelible impression on all of us. Janine, thank you kindly for making some time to, for us tonight. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited to see uh, all the um, interesting speakers we're going to have over the weekend and get an opportunity to talk soccer for a lot of hours. <laughs> Uh, next, let's meet Carol Holt, part of the Angels program for over a decade, represented Alberta at the provincial level and won the National University Championship. And Carol, I found this nugget about you doing a bit of research. You won the ACAC Women's Coach of the Year Award, not once, not twice, not three times, four times, three of them in a row. Thank you so much for being with us. What an exceptional resume. Thanks very much. This is, uh, this is going to be a great weekend. I'm looking forward to our conversation tonight. And uh, everybody, please say hello to Danica Wu, another Edmonton product, had an award-winning career with Ohio State, and then from there headed overseas, suited up in a, over 100 games in the Frau Bundesliga. And of course, uh, you probably recognize her name. She spent many years in the national team program representing Canada, U17, U20, and the senior level. Danny, so thank you so much for making some time for us tonight and just being part of this panel. No, I'm excited. It's going to be a great weekend. So because we're focusing on the Angels, Janine, why don't you kick things off? What do you remember about your early days playing the game in Edmonton and what was it like? Uh, well, it was a long time ago, as you mentioned, so it was a lot different than it is now. Um, but uh, I was really, really lucky to start playing in Edmonton with the Angels when I did because the veteran players on that team had already had national team experience. Tracy David was on the team, Joan McKeckern, Sue Brand, Anita Brand, um, Sue Simon. I mean, I just got to come in and play with all, these, all of these amazing players that had so much experience already. So I just got to go in and, and listen and learn and, and run around an awful lot. Carol, what about you? Um, well, I uh, I started my uh, my youth soccer not until I was about fifteen years old, so I was a little bit later. But early on, I had opportunities to uh, probably in my second year of youth soccer, I had a an invitation to come in and join the Angels. So um, it was a great opportunity. And like Janine mentioned, I had a chance right from the get go to play with a lot of the players that she mentioned. And then and then going forward, I mean, getting to play with players like Janine and uh, Shannon Rose now and uh, Liz Herbert and, and, you know, just so many uh, Edmontonians that, um, you know, went on to represent Canada and, and, you know, just being surrounded by those players on a regular basis is a really fond memory for me. And Danica, for you, you had a bit of a different journey where, yes, you did start in Edmonton, but then at a pretty young age, you just headed out east to continue your soccer career. Yeah, so I, my last year playing youth soccer in Edmonton was probably when I was 13. And then um, I had decided with my parents that I wanted to be a professional soccer player. Um, and so out east in Quebec, um, they had a W League, so it's semi-pro, 
And uh, I started heading out there when I was 14, 15 years old. So a little bit different, <laughs> but. Yeah, what, what was that experience like in terms of, uh, obviously you're going somewhere where you also need to be able to speak French and get acclimated to that kind of environment versus what we experience here in Alberta. Yeah, so for me, I was definitely a homebody growing up. Um, leaving home for national team camps and everything. It was really tough. I missed home, my family. Um, so homesickness was a big um, um, factor that probably, you know, discourages a lot of young athletes. But um, I lived in a billet house with seven other girls <laughs> and it was a blast. It was a great experience. Um, I wouldn't change it, but it would be great to have had the opportunity to stay home and, and compete at a high level, despite being a younger age. Um, I was lucky to play with players like Amy Walsh and, and everyone out East. So it was a great learning experience. And I brought a lot back um, as a youth player before going to university. So. Well, let's get on to the topic of university. It's a fascinating one because for two of you, you stayed on this side of the border. However, Danny, you decided to go to the U.S. So Janine and Carol, why don't I start with you on this one? Maybe take us through the decision of playing soccer in Canada at the university college level versus going to the U.S. Um. When I was playing, there were there were already players playing down in the U.S. There was Charmaine Hooper was playing down in the U.S., Angela Kelly, um, a few other of the Ontario girls were all playing down in the U.S. Um, I did consider it for, for probably a nanosecond, but for me, I had the fortunate um, situation, like I mentioned earlier, there were already numerous national team players playing on my club team. Um, so that was the one factor. If I stayed and played university here in the fall, I could continue to play with those players um, and train with them with my club as well. Um, and then the other factor was at the time, Neil Turnbull was the head coach of the national team and he was located in Edmonton as well. So, you know, I could have gone uh, to the States and I could have played at a, at a, you know, at a high level down there as well. But at the time when I started playing university in 1988, the CIS was a very, very strong league, and there were many national team players, Canadian national team players playing in that in the um, university league here. So for me, I, I felt fortunate in the sense that I had the opportunity to choose. I could choose to um, stay and play, stay at home, go to university at home, um, have that comfort level, or um, I could have gone to the U.S. because other players had done it. Um, the opportunities were were there. They weren't may, maybe as plentiful as they are now. But um, I just, uh, for me, the fortunate fact of having everybody here in Edmonton made it a very easy decision for me to stay and play at the U of A. Carol, what about for you? Um, well, I, I mean, I think when I first started playing and I saw... Um, I went out and watched a lot of the pandas games and I, you know, really I thought about the opportunity of, of playing there at some point. I didn't go directly into a uh, university. I did a college diploma first and actually Janine was uh, the head coach of the college team there. So she was my first college coach. Um, and then I took a bit of time off and, and explored some options and decided to go and pursue a degree at the U of A. And it was one of the best decisions. Again, like we had, we had great players involved. Um, you know, Tracy David, one of the best coaches in, in university sport I was there and, you know, had a chance to play for her and um, sort of like Janine, it was a bit of a no brainer uh, at the end of the day to be able to play for that program. Uh, we won a national championship in my second last year and, so those are memories that, um, you know, just I didn't really consider going um, to the U.S. It was just it seemed like things were too good here right at home. And, and that was the best choice for me at the time. Danny, why don't we go to you? You went to Ohio. Did you ever consider playing university ball in Canada? And really, what was your decision to head south? Um, I think. I would have liked to stay home. As I said, I am a homebody. 
Um, but for us, I think the 90s, 91, 92 is when going to America Free University was kind of becoming the norm and kind of becoming something that if you wanted to continue to stay on with national team, it's something that you had to commit to. Um, I think from our U20 team, so for 2012 um, World Cup, I can say maybe one or two players from that roster stayed in Canada and the rest of us were in America playing collegiately in the NCAA. So quite a different experience. Um, for us, it wasn't so much of a choice. It was more um, a natural progression from national training center um, straight to us for college. And Danny, I'd also like to circle back to you on, so you graduate and you decided to head overseas to play professionally. We talked about it. You, you suited up in over a hundred games in the Bundesliga, which is phenomenal. Uh, you also talk about how you're a homebody. So you head overseas. How yeah, difficult was that it. decision for you? <laughs> um, I think what I really want to experience um, was the soccer culture or the football culture in Europe. Um, I had the taste in North America. And when I went over there, I was expecting, you know, you know, I was a student athlete. I went to university and then I went to training and everything. But over there, it was eye opening. It was eat, sleep, drink, football 24 <laughs> 7. And I think that was one of the experiences that I really wanted to learn and, and grow with. Um, and I think that as a player to develop, um, you know, it was. Um, something that, you know, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. So um, a lot of people, they get drafted from college to play in the NWSL in America. Um, but you're kind of getting the same, um, same soccer mentality as you would in, in university. And I think that having that little switch was a big step for my career in um, terms of a player development. So does it surprise you how many people, and is, is something you just brought up, does it surprise you how many people are staying in Europe? Because actually I just saw today that Shalina Zadorsky signed another contract with the Spurs. Yeah. We see some of the top American players, they, they have decided to stay in the UK. What do you think? Do you think the product is better in Europe or is it just the style of play or what is it driving people to that side of the world? I think it's just different. I think that in America, a lot of it is athleticism and, and drive and um, they have the, the, the resources and everything to kind of push forward the game. But in Europe, I think it's all about grassroots. We have U8 players that make their way up through the ranks to make first team to be able to play in the Bundesliga. And that's something that's more of a norm rather than, you know, something extraordinary. Um, and I think that is something to look at and say, this is what we want for football. This is what we want to develop for ourselves to grow us, to be a top five, top four nation in the soccer world. Right. So yeah. I think, you know, everything, America is great. Europe is great. It's, hard to compare completely um but just different aspects of it make it you know something to look forward to carol you've been involved heavily in the canadian university game uh, from playing to coaching what kind of strides have you seen it make over the past let's say couple of decades i think just the overall quality of um of the players have developed in Canada and so we're seeing a better um, product on the field ultimately. Um, I think everything from the players to the coaches to the sports science that is used, um, everything has improved and the standards continue to be raised every year. Um, we're seeing um, amazing players come through both the university system as well as the, the CCAA. I mean, one of, uh, one of the things I think I'm enjoying the most right now about um, watching the women's national team play is Evelyn Bienz. And um, I had two years in my position at, at Nate where we played against her. We played against her in the national final. And, uh, you know, to see her now being um, 
a great player for Canada and having a huge impact there. I think that's a great example of the type of players that are coming through our um, Canadian university and, and college system. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because thinking back, there haven't been, at least in the last like decade-ish, where players have graduated to the national team. Like I think of maybe Josie Belanger probably is one. Uh, Desiree Scott is another one that's because she was in Manitoba. But I guess what has always puzzled me just watching it from the outside is why is it that more players from Canadian university aren't making their way to the national team? I know it's a big question, so go ahead. <laughs> I think this is one for Janine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll take a crack at it. I really, I don't know for sure. Um, I think it kind of stems a little bit from what Danny was referring to. Um, there was a period of time there, probably at least a decade, if not more. And it sounds like it was overlapping with Danny's time, but uh, where it was believed and strongly believed within the club system and the, and the soccer system in Canada, that if you did not go to the States to play, you wouldn't really be looked at to play for the national team. And I think it was a, a I don't really know where it came from or how it happened, but I think that that stage, I guess, or phase of our, our program um, hurt our, our Canadian system a little bit because we had some, we had quality coaches in the, in the um, CIS system, in the, in the college system, there was quality coaching there. There were quality players playing there, but as soon as all these top players started to make those decisions to go down to the States, it, um, it shifted. And um, I think now that there's lots of opportunities outside of college, whether it's the NWSL, whether it's the UWS, whether it's any of these other leagues, whether it's going to Europe to play in the Bundesliga or England to play in, their, in theirs, there's all these opportunities for these different paths now. And so players are able to make different choices. Um, but I think that with all those choices, it ends up that there's not going to be as many players coming through our system until we have the opportunity to change our system and strengthen our system and encourage players to stay within the Canadian system. I think that's lacking. You've heard national team players talk about it. I think that's something that is, is upon us to try and correct and to try and move forward. What do you think... Janine, now that you mention it, what do you think is, is the key message to players who might be in, let's say, grade 10, grade 11 right now, and they're weighing their options, perhaps a scholarship is on the horizon? What can entice them to stay in Canada for school? I think what some people don't understand is there are scholarships available in Canada. Um, it may be not seen as um, that big full ride or however it's usually you know, described and, and built up. Um, I think what people don't understand is they, the cost of education in Canada is significantly cheaper than the cost of education in the States. And I think the scholarships here reflect that. So you may be told you can get a scholarship for X number of thousands of dollars. Um, and it doesn't sound like much, but when you're putting that against the cost of your education here, I think, um, you know, it's fairly significant. But I think that there's just been this whole culture of, going to the States to get that scholarship, to get that full ride. Now, granted, there's some great programs in the States where if you can get the opportunity to go and play there, absolutely you'd want to go play there. The level is, is, is incredibly um, competitive and it's, and it's very high. But for some of the players that are maybe going to some of the smaller schools or the Div 2 schools, if, if they're that quality of a player, it would be, you know, maybe it would be nice to try and encourage them to find somewhere in Canada to play and have... Um, a pathway for them to go down and, and maybe that's a discussion for another day, but creating that pathway, what is after grade 10, 11, 12, what is after, um, you know, university or college, two-year college, three-year college, four-year university, five-year university, what's after that for them in Canada to play within? Because we know not everybody's going to be on the national team. It's not possible, but there is yeah. the possibility for players to continue to play for many, many years. 
Well, speaking of the national team, I hope you guys are okay if I change gears just a little bit because uh, both you, Janine and, and Danny, you spent some time with the national team, not just some time, I mean, a lot of time within the national program. Why don't I start with you, Janine? Looking back, what are some of your fondest memories, especially when you think back to those World Cups that you were able to take part in? Because those were pretty watershed, groundbreaking, prolific for really what we're seeing today. I think um, when I think back on those, um, I mean, I had the opportunity. I got to play in the first CONCACAF Women's Championship in 1991. I got to play in the first World Cup that Canada went to. Um, so I got to do a lot of those firsts. But when I think back now, especially where the program has gotten to, when I look back on, on, those, um, on those years and those memories, I would probably have, if I'm being honest, 85% of those memories have nothing to do with what went on on the field and has everything to do with what went on off the field. There's so many crazy things that we had to do and go through in my first few years on the national team, just because everything was so new and it wasn't out there. You know, I remember we got to the, to the world cup in Sweden in 1995 and we found out once we got there, we had all of our gear, we had everything that it was, it was, um, illegal gear like we had um score was our sponsor and so we had score all across the back of our our, tra our track jackets and so the subs sitting on the bench they had tape all across their jacket because it was too large the sponsor size so our sponsor score hadn't done their homework in terms of what could be on our jerseys we're taking we're taking score um uh banding out of the waistbands because we weren't allowed to have it you know there were so many crazy things that that happened and just it ended up bringing us you know that much closer together because you know we were competitive on the field um and i think had we had a bit more time together and a little bit more opportunity we could have been that much more competitive but getting there into that first world cup and playing against england and being super competitive against england super competitive against nigeria we knew we were right there. We obviously weren't tier one because we were losing significantly to those tier one teams that were winning World Cups, but we were, we were there. And, um, you know, I, I kind of take a little bit of pride in that in the sense that we did a lot with a little, and um, I'm just really glad that we persevered through that. Danny, I don't want to put you on the spot, but what do you remember of that game, Toronto, June 2013, Canada versus U.S.? And of course, that was dubbed the big old rematch, Canada, USA, the first time that they would meet since 2012 at the London Olympics, the semifinal that I think we all kind of remember pretty well. I know it's hard to believe it's been almost 10 years, but what do you remember about taking that pitch? Because that was pretty wild stuff. It was, it was really, really billed quite highly. Yeah. Do you want the scripted version or do you want like my actual memory? <laughs> Listen, tell, tell us what you know. I would love to hear. Who I got there, so. half by, I don't know, Allie Krieger. She sent a long ball to Sydney LaRue and they scored. That was the third goal. <laughs> Scripted version. It was a great experience. The atmosphere was amazing. Um, yeah. The fans and everyone was so supportive. Um, the build up to that game, it was serious. You know, um, you know, we wanted redemption. There was a lot on the line on this game, but in the end, um, you know, it's it it was you know a great experience as my first cap, um, and you know a lot of it is like those blackout moments where you train so hard and then you get to the point where you always dreamed about or dreamt about, and and then you kind of don't remember anything else. <laughs> yeah, I just have to say. Sandra, if I can jump in here for a second, I was actually at that game. <laughs> and um, all I can say is I didn't know that that was your first cap with the senior <laughs> team, Danny. And all I can say is that would have been one heck of a game to jump into for your first mm -hmm. cap, because <laughs> as a player that had been out of the system for 13 or 14 years already, that game I was so hyped for. It was unbelievable <laughs> because of that rematch. So yeah. I can't imagine having that as my first cap and having to step <laughs> on the field in that game as my first cap. So kudos to you. No. Allie Krieger or not, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> <Money>. <laughs> Denny, did you have family there 
with watching or were they just watching on TV? Yeah, I had relatives in in Toronto, but yeah, my family stayed home. So I was in Quebec when I got the call up um, playing for Laval and and then um, it was a last minute call up and then just flew me over and and played. So (laughs) I got to ask, what do you guys think of the Canada US rivalry? How has it progressed over the year it's pretty good I mean in all women's sport it's good it's good in hockey but it's especially good in soccer where are we with that rivalry is it about to turn a corner I mean I think back to the she believes here a couple of months ago and and Canada looked pretty formidable versus the U.S. but curious how you guys see them stacking up against each other right now in 2021 Anyone? <laughs> Carol, why don't you? You haven't you haven't spoken in a while. How do you think? Well, I, I mean, it's such a good, it's always such an exciting game when, like you said, in not just soccer, but Canada US is a big game all the time. And I think um, what we're what we're seeing now are some some new faces to the program, which is is exciting. Um, there's other players that I think other people are talking about in terms of like, why is this player not involved or why is that player not involved? And I think that's, that's a really good thing for the program. Um, and, you know, maybe looking at, you know, Danny's first experience, there's going to be a lot of first experiences for a lot of these young players coming in and they've got nothing to lose. So I think that's the beauty of it is that there's always, it's always going to be a good game. Um, the pressure is not necessarily on Canada, but that doesn't mean that our our, our expectations are, are lower. I think our expectations are actually very, very high. I would have to say that our expectations against the U.S. have always been high. They maybe haven't always been realistic, but they've always been high. Um, you, you know, we stepped on the field and got spanked numerous times in the 90s playing against the Mia Hams and the Christine Lillies and the Michelle Akers and uh, you know all of their top players played in that decade Um, but uh, we always stepped on the field thinking this is going to be the day and I think that the the current team still has that mentality that this is going to be the day they just have the added luxury that it's a realistic thought Um, you know they do have the skill and the opportunity or the, the skill and, and I think the determination and um, probably the planning and preparation that, that it could be the time and like it could happen right now. I, I truly believe that. Yeah. Danny, what about you? Going off um, as like a, from youth all the way up to senior, it's always been a rivalry, um, you know, U 20s, CONCACAF we lost out to the U.S. in the final and I think that grit that's so Canadian is kind of what the U.S. fears the most um they know that we're not for it's never going to be an easy game against us and so what you know both Carol and Janine are saying is that you know the pressure is on them because for us we have nothing to lose and and when we give it all you know Canada can play amazing football right so For the three of you, I'll ask you all the same question. What is your, and you could be involved in it or not, what is your most iconic Canadian soccer moment for you? Christine's hat trick in London. Hands down. For me, anyway. I love that one, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. That one I think the, for me was the the um, overtime goal. I think Diana Matheson's uh, overtime goal to win the bronze medal. That was uh, I still get goosebumps every once in a while. It pops up on social media and and just to watch that, I could watch that over and over uh, all all day long. Gosh, I couldn't even name my so. The reason that I wanted to play national team was because um, our team was the ball girls for the 2002 U19 World Cup that came to Canada. And I remember, you know, going to those games and thinking, holy, like, this is amazing. (laughs) And I think like that moment was like 
kind of life changing for me because that's kind of what set me on the path that I went on for the last 10, 15 years. So I think kind of having that tournament at home was, was, was a big moment for Canada and for me. So yeah, I, I would actually pick that one too. 2002, the U19s were that tournament <laughs> is really what drove my love for soccer. And I was absolutely jealous that it was in Edmonton and <laughs> the, what were there like 45,000? Like it I remember it, it set a record <laughs> until the 2015 rolled around. But I have to say Edmonton always, always steps up for women's soccer. It's awesome. Um, Janine, you helped organize, I believe you were on the organizing committee for 2015. Looking back on that event, how prolific was it for the growth of the sport in this country and the fact that we did host it from coast to coast? Um, I think what you guys are alluding to with the 2002, though, with that inaugural one, that was the one that, that put us on the map. That was a huge factor in us even getting considered for the 2014 and 2015 U20 and the Women's World Cup. Um, because we had done so much in that in that eight to 10 years that followed that tournament all through the 2000s, Canada had taken huge strides internationally um, because of that tournament. And um, I think 2015, 2014 and 2015 um, continued that. I mean, we didn't really ever have any doubt that we were going to fill stadiums. We knew we'd be able to fill stadiums. That was never a question. Um, I think from, from the organization standpoint is it was, it was time again. We wanted to get back Canada back on that stage in that limelight and showing people what we can do and also to get that new crop of Danny's you know, coming out and, and playing and, and pursuing that dream. Um, so I think it was huge. And the fact that it was from coast to coast um, just speaks to women's women's soccer in this country. It's, it, you know, it's we're ready for that next step and that next level and that next push to grow the game, I think. What is that next step? Because I, 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 I see a lot, you know, like I'll read social media, I'll read articles and, and the work that I do myself and the consensus with a lot of people is the fact that we don't, we don't have a league in Canada for women. Uh, just speaking to Bev Priestman and she mentioned that it's crucial that Canada gets an NWS, uh, uh, NWSL team and, and I agree with that and it would be great. But I think it's also crucial that we have teams within our cities here giving our players a place to play if perhaps they don't want to go overseas or they don't want to, um, maybe they, they don't think that the NWSL is an option because they might not see playing time. And that, that's an American objective to get their players that playing time. So how do we go about getting these players a place to play and I know it's a loaded question but I think the fact is right now we are the only Canada is the only top 10 FIFA ranked country on the women's side that doesn't have a professional league yeah I mean Carol you can speak to this as well um Carol you speak to this <laughs> okay Jen. um Thanks, Carol. <laughs> well there's a couple of things I think there's um you know, right now we have, uh, over the last couple of years, the Canada Soccer has launched the National Youth Club Licensing uh, Credential, which um, Edmonton Scottish is uh, has that credential, and it and along with a few number of other clubs across Alberta now. Um, and what that does is it creates a standards based league for young players. It increases the opportunities for competition it, it increases opportunities for uh, coaching standards to be enhanced and all these things um, bubble up to where do they go next so to your question Sanders where do they go next and having um, a pathway for young female players to um, naturally progress into is essential like we we have to have a, a place for players to play it doesn't mean that they're going to stay here forever and ever. Amen. But what it does mean is we have good players here in Canada, but we don't have a foundation for them to, um, to continue to develop beyond youth soccer. 
And we need to have something that takes them to the, the next level for them to have um, an opportunity to present themselves to potential national team coaches, um, to have exposure at that level. Um, and then beyond that, then they can choose because we've done our job as coaches and as clubs to develop these players. And if we do our job in, in providing those opportunities, then, um, then more players will have more choices to represent Canada um, and to be Canadians playing in other parts of the world, if that's what they so choose to do. But it, it is essential that we have something that players can um, aspire to here in Canada. We actually have a bunch of questions that have been submitted. So I'm going to maybe move over to that portion of our panel. And Carol, this one's for you off the top. Uh, you were a college head coach for many years. Has a ref or a game day staff member ever ignored you, assuming your male assistant coach must be the head coach of your team? Jeez, I wonder who uh, who's asking that question. Um, so I... I I think this happened to me every year um, and it got to the point where I could see it kind of happening on game day where we would be out on the field getting ready for the game and the fourth official would come over looking for the game sheet. But as a female head coach, I wasn't the person that they would go to and I would watch the official just walk across to um, for several years, I think all but one year, I had um, a male assistant coach and they automatically went to that person or they would go to the game day coordinator who was male um, to say, can I get the game sheet coach? And their response is, well, you better go and ask the head coach. She's over there. Um, so I, honestly, it happened every year, multiple times in some years. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate, but I think it's just... Uh, we need more females coaching at that level um, for it to become the norm and not the exception. Janine, the next question is for you. Who was the hardest or the best player you ever played against? Oh, um, I don't know that I can name just one because like I mentioned earlier, I think um, I played in the nineties. So I played against Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly, Michelle Akers for probably two or three years. Um, so, to, I mean, to play against either Mia Hamm or Christine Lilly was as, as a back line defender. Um, y you always had to be very mentally prepared when you stepped on that field. Cause we used to say it was basically like just doing wind sprints from the center line back all game long for 90 minutes. Right. Um, but then there was one other player that we played against that played on, on Norway in 1995 and in 1999. And she was actually, I mean, Norway had phenomenal players as well. And, and actually the current coach of the England national team played on that Norway team as a midfielder, super, super talented player, Hege Reset. But this um, player, and I can't remember her first name, which I feel bad about, but her last name was Aronis. And she was about almost six feet. She was five foot 11. And that was the, the years that Evan Pellerud was coaching Norway. So it was the long ball game. And I think she usually scored at least three or four goals against us because they would play a long ball into her head. And she was phenomenal with her head, like an outstanding header of the ball. And then it would be in the back of the net because no one, we'd have to like climb up her to try and, you know, fighter for the ball because she's five foot foot 11 and could jump and was fast so I would say those three players for me personally were probably the toughest that I played against. Danny for you what was it like to move away from home at a young age to play soccer what advice would you give your younger self now? Um, it was definitely hard um, I had homesickness a lot so I called home almost every day. <laughs> um, but I think looking at the bigger picture, it was something that I knew I had to do to get to my goal. And I think that commitment to my dream was um, kind of more important or like a sacrifice that I was willing to give up to um, do what I wanted to do. Um, advice I would give myself? Mm. Stop being late going to the airport. 
I don't know. Maybe don't pack so much every time we go away because you're really not going to wear anything that you're going to pack. <laughs> Well, and just staying with you, Marta wants to know what soccer team did Danica play for in the Bundesliga? So maybe take us through a little bit of your time playing in Germany and who you played for. Sure. So my first um, pro year, I played for Hereford SV, which is a little town um, kind of in the middle of Germany. Um, and then my last four, five, five years, I played um, for MSP. The Duisburg and SGS Essen. So um, in the west of Germany. So were there other Canadians playing with you at that time or were you the lone Canadian there? Um, from 2014 to 2020, I think there were Sophie Schmidt was there. Um, she played for Frankfurt a couple of years. Um, and then, wow, maybe one other. There were, there was very yeah. few of us. Yeah, very few of us. So how's your German? Oh, fluent. Fluent. Oh. Six, seven years there will do that to you. <laughs> and uh, for someone who's never experienced Oktoberfest, Ooh, what's yes. that like? Is it awesome? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> it is very culturally enriching. <laughs> I like that answer. <laughs> uh, I have a qu uh, question here for all three of you. Uh, they say, I coach an amazing group of uh, 2011s, so 11s. What advice can you give to a group of girls that are dreaming about soccer? Please. I think the, uh, I mean, enjoy it. Uh, it has to be fun. And, uh, you know, for the young players coming through, um, I think there's, um, you know, work on your skills outside of soccer. If you love soccer, you'll find a way to, uh, we say this with the, the team that, that Janine and I coach is it's not just what happens on the field when you're there at training. It's a lot of times it's the stuff that happens away and the things that you do to, to get to, to improve and, and, but it's got to be fun um, for the players, and that's where the, the coaches come in, where they have to they have to do their job. And it's been a tough year for coaches to make it in, engaging and fun. And um, but there's tons of really good examples of coaches out there who are, who are creating that environment for their players. And then as a player, just um, show up every day, ready to work hard, have a good attitude, be a good teammate. Yeah, going off that, um, I think that, you know, since everything is kind of shutting down the next couple of weeks, um, for me personally, I thought it was really important to watch football, um, you know, being able to have someone to look up to or, you know, learn from um, and and kind of appreciate the game more. Um, my favorite team was Arsenal. So, you know, we had our ups and downs, but um it was always exciting and, and a moment that I shared with my dad. So, um, you know, it, it soccer brought a lot of different aspects to my life. Um, not just on the field, like Carol was saying, but, you know, outside of it and, and, you know, it was always something fun that I could do instead of having to work for it. I got to watch and sit and eat <laughs> and cheer for my favorite team. So. <laughs> Janine, what about you? I don't know. I think they nailed most of the, most of the things that I would have said, I think, I think that the two things, well, the three things that they can take away for sure is number one, it has to be fun. You have to love to do it. If you don't love it, then find something that you do love. Um, and the second thing is, is just watch it. Like, like Danny said, the, the kids today are so unbelievably fortunate in terms of what they get to watch on TV. Um, they now can watch women play, they can watch men play, they can, you know, they can take their pick of who their role models want, you know, can be. Um, but I think in terms of, um, you know, advice to better yourself, it's like Carol said, what, um, get outside and play and just do th stuff for fun, figure stuff out, do crazy things, learn different touches on the ball, learn different things with the ball, um, have fun doing it. 
and then watch other people because uh, my one move and it was literally my one move was the Johan Cruyff. And if I hadn't have seen that, then I don't know whether, you know, I don't know what I would have done because it was my one move. It worked every time. Um, yeah, and you, you were know, really good at that though, Janae. <laughs> well, you know, nails that. Like, like I yeah. used to say, why would I change it when it works? Why do I need something else? No, but I think um, getting out there and having fun and watching the game are the three best things you can do as a youngster. And it's the opportunities are huge, so they should take advantage of them. You guys actually touched on the pandemic, and obviously this is something none of us have experienced before. We're going into another shutdown here for, for what, three weeks now, and obviously that's disrupting what a lot of these clubs has, have started so far with this spring season. Uh, curious if you guys can maybe offer some unique ways for, for players to maybe, if they're watching or coaches, uh, unique ways right now for players to train because they can't be together. What can they do at home? And just so they're getting touches on the ball and keeping up. So when, you know, knock on wood, we do reopen and, and things do get behind us, uh, they can continue and, and really get back to the game that they love. I think, um, one of the things that, um, you know, we tried, I mean, people are done with virtual and zoom <laughs> classes, right? So we're, we're at least we're at a decent time of year where we can, um, do some programming outside now that we're, we're essentially locked down for the next few weeks. I think, um, you know, creating opportunities to keep kids engaged and connected to each other. Um, and that could be, I know some of the things that we've done with our team is we, we send out uh, daily challenges of just silly things that you can do, competitive things you can do, like who can do the most juggles, or uh, we sent one out this weekend, the challenge for the kids is their fastest 1K. So to keep them fit and engaged and, and thinking about soccer, but just trying to keep them um, um, involved and physically active as much as anything right now. Um, we'll get there. Um, it's been a hard year for, for clubs, for players, for coaches. It feels like we're a little bit exhausted, like, oh, do we have to do this again? But I think what we've shown over the past year is that we can do it. We'll come up with new ideas. And I think as a soccer community, keeping, um, keep sharing those ideas is really important. Um, and just because one club is doing it doesn't mean that another club can't do it or team or whatever. So within your clubs, keep talking to the other coaches, uh, supporting each other, sharing ideas. Does anybody out have anything else to add on that point there? Nailed it, Carol. Works for me. Not on. Uh, I I think this will probably be the final question. I wasn't expecting one for me, but somebody's asking, we're starting to see more female sports commentators and sports media personalities on the air. How difficult has it been to reach those levels in media when it's been a male dominated world? And Carol, what you said earlier really resonated with me. Uh, I did some play by play for the Calgary Inferno, who were the, the hockey team here, the Canadian women's hockey team. And I was setting up to do a play-by-play -play broadcast. And, and one of the officials came up and was like, okay, I have the, the, the rosters and handed it to, to the young man who was doing promotions because he, you know, he assumed that was who was calling the game. And I said, no, sir, that's to me. And he looked at me and said, I didn't know women could call hockey. <laughs> And this was just two years ago. And th these are, it's just like you guys, these are the, the constant obstacles. And it, it, my advice for somebody that might want to get into sports media, and I try to, this is the mantra that I have is prove them wrong. Just go out and do it and grab the reins. And I remember talking to some kids not too long ago about journalism. And I think this echoes to the world of soccer. If, yeah, it's, if not me, then who? And I think uh, just to circle back to all three of you guys, this is how you guys have led your careers, whether it be on the pitch or behind the bench, if, if not me, then who? And I guess I'll turn it back to you for some final thoughts as we, we wrap up the round table. Just, you know, where do you see us going forward and, and what's your, your final advice for anybody watching? 
I think uh, for me, from a coaching perspective, it's, it's one thing, it's really important that, that females who are interested in coaching take the coaching courses and get the credentials. That's one thing that they have to do. Um, but the other part of it too is once you have those credentials is you have to be willing to put yourself out there a little bit and, um, and get involved with teams and be prepared to fail um, and lose games and to have um, difficult, difficult conversations with parents and coaches. And um, some of my, my best experiences as a coach have come from failing and having the opportunity to, to, to try again, but you don't get those opportunities without putting yourself out there first. And so to all the, the female coaches out there, I would say is, is get out there and apply for jobs as they come up. If you're, if you're a qualified coach, get in there and, um, and, and get involved with, it, with youth, uh, males, females, doesn't matter. Just get involved and, uh, and prove, prove other people wrong. Yeah, going off of um, both of your stories, um, you know, being a professional soccer player wasn't, you know, a thing until eight, nine years ago. And so, you know, when, you know, people ask, oh, what do you do? And, and you have to say, you know, what you do, you're, you, you kind of hesitate because they're like, oh, is that all you do? Or like, what do you actually do? And, you know, um, you know, it was a full-time thing for me in Europe and, and um, having that, you know, foot in the door as to say was kind of different because I was afraid to tell people what I did. Um, not because I was embarrassed, but because, you know, who says that? Um, and I think the whole mindset and changing, um, how we perceive, you know, our community, our society is a big step for women in general. Um, and it's something that you have to risk it for, um, if you think it's worth it. Right. So, um, we all believe in, in, the cause. And I think, um, being able to talk about all these topics is, um, a great step in the right direction. So. And I think just to add to those two points a little bit is, is, um, you know, for anybody that's like a, a different club or, or a parent or a coach or even a player, don't be afraid to ask for things. Don't be afraid to ask your club for things. Don't be afraid to ask for support for things. Um, if we don't ask, it's like you said, if we don't ask or if we don't try and do things to make the clubs better um, or to push things forward, then I don't think anyone's going to do it for us. Um, Scottish is, is phenomenal. I mean, I, obviously I'm a little bit biased because I grew up with, in the Angels and um, but I think the things that they're doing, there's not a lot that that Carol and Nick haven't asked for that hasn't been provided. And if they hadn't have asked, it might not have been provided. And if they hadn't have asked, it may not have even been thought of. So don't be afraid to ask for things. The worst they can say is no. And the best they can do is consider it. And, and um, you know, hopefully it'll it'll be brought on board or it'll be considered and, and it can move things forward. Fantastic. Well, that'll wrap up the roundtable. The Angels past, present, and future. A big, big thank you to Janine, Carol, Danica for joining us tonight as part of Game Changers Women in Soccer Symposium. So cool to hear from you guys. And up next is Transformational Leadership with Deborah Samani. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sandra.